Good evening, all, and welcome. Tonight, I have a collection of isolated rural stories, or middle of nowhere, as they are sometimes called. I'd like to apologize for my absence. I will talk about that at the end of the video. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My family and I went on a trip to the Hocking Hills area of Southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town of Moonville Rail Tunnel. I have never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect, but I did know it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin, using Google for GPS to the location. We started driving, and it's, for lack of better words, a real impoverished area where we're driving. Hills have eyes kind of-esque. We literally only see a few cars on the way there, and are on the back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter a forest, and we are close to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering a bubble wood. For a little information, I drive a Mercedes, and I am just lucky to have my husband in the car, a black man with dreadlocks, my 10-year-old son, nonverbal autistic, and my six-year-old daughter. We drive down this really creepy stone road in the forest, and there was nothing back there. No houses, no cars, nobody. We see signs that are close and pull into the parking lot. There is a footbridge. We walk over the footbridge and make our way towards the tunnel, which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel towards us while we're on foot. He gets out of his truck with a chainsaw, and it's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere we go and through the tunnel. I try to make small talk with him and pulled some info about if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources, etc., but he really wasn't budging. So we turn around and walk out of the tunnel, and he starts using the chainsaw behind us, and the sound just echoes throughout the tunnel. At this point, we have no cell phone service, and no one knows my family is here except us. I was already worried my car was sending the wrong idea to people, like we have money or something. We don't. We rush to the car, and get the kids into their booster seats, and this guy comes driving over the footbridge in his truck towards us to the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how his truck fits on it. He stops again, gets out of his truck, and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief. About this time, I notice there are dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were his, and we compared his hand and my son's, and they did not match. I don't know who could have touched the car while we were gone, because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time we were there, and we got out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later, I look into my rearview mirror, and there's a bunch of dust kicking up behind us, and there he is. He had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch us up. There's nowhere to go in this woods. The road is basically one lane, and we have no cell phone service nor GPS. Every time I think to lose him, there he is again, I'm waiting for my tire to get popped or something, or this guy to ram me off the road and into a ravine in the woods. Finally, we get out of the woods, and I turn out and he's still following. We were following printed directions to get back, and I ended up making the wrong turn in the excitement. The guy in the truck was finally gone, and I turned around to go back past the stone road that goes into the forest. There is one lone house near this road, and there is his truck, parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods and taken some back way to the tunnel. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event. This story happened back in the 90s to my parents during their senior year of high school. Since their group of friends already had cars, the favorite thing they loved to do was night hiking around the state's local mental hospital, mainly to its old dairy farm. This was located on the side of a mountain, surrounded by agricultural fields and an open grassland. 
Since the dairy farm was not close to the mental hospital and the nearest city life was located about five miles away, at night the area was extra dark and quiet. Before the dairy farm was closed down, the patients from the mental hospital would go there for work. During this time, some patients lost their lives at this location due to accidents. By the 90s, it was abandoned and left like a ghost town of its own, especially due to the rumors of it being haunted. It made the perfect place for a fearful experience. So this particular night at around two in the morning, my dad, mum, and four of their female friends and one male friend planned to go to the dairy farm. They took two cars, and when they got to the usual parking spots on the side of the mountain, they saw that there was already a group of 20 people standing around their cars. When my parents and their friends got out of their cars, they noticed that the group of men all had shaved heads, were Caucasian, and in their mid-twenties. As my parents walked past them, both groups ignored each other and avoided making eye contact. However, my mum turns her head to see one of the men, and as she did this, the man pulled back his jacket and showed a pistol tucked in his pants. Then he pulled back his lower lips, which revealed he had KKK tattooed on his bottom lip. Then they were out of hearing range, and my mum whispered to my dad, the man has a gun, and he has KKK tattooed to his lips. My dad brushed it off, thinking my mum was over-exaggerating, and said that it was too dark to even notice these things. So with that, my parents and their friends walked through the grassland to get to the dairy farm. The hike to get there is about half a mile from where they parked. However, as soon as they got to the farm, they heard gunshots coming from the direction of the cars. Fearing that something happened to their cars, they booked it back to the parking lot. When they got there, the group of men were already gone. They saw that all their tires were slashed and their windows were broken and smashed. My dad, who used a particular colored blanket as a seat cover and his stereo was stolen. Now they just stood there by their cars wondering what to do next. It's not like they could call someone for help. No one had a cell phone and since they were deep in a secluded area, they could not flag someone down for a quick pickup. The nearest gas station with a payphone was five miles away. Both my dad and his male friend didn't want to leave the cars alone since they both drove classic cars and they feared the men would come back. Eventually it was decided amongst them that sending both males to run to the payphone was the best option, leaving the women by themselves with the cars. This was because they feared that the shaved head men were waiting down the road expecting them to walk to the payphone. My dad and his friend ran to the gas station and they left my mum and her friends all gathered with heavy rocks to use as some sort of protective weapon and hid in the bushes behind the trees. Two tow trucks rolled into the parking spot. An immense fear spread through the group until they saw that out of the tow trucks came my dad, his brothers and the friend. They hooked up the cars, towed the trucks and were out of there in minutes. My dad told my mum that as they were running down the dark and empty road, they kept their eyes opened just in case the men were hiding with their car lights off. Luckily, they got to the station without an issue. The next part may be hard to believe, but is 100% true. Two weeks had passed and my dad managed to get his car fully repaired and drivable again. My mum and dad were driving to the local store where they parked and got out of the car. As they were walking into the store, a man was walking towards them. As he got closer, my mum realised that it was the same shaved-headed man who flashed the gun at her. My mum immediately told my dad, but just like the first time, he denied this was true. Then two weeks later, at the same store, my mum and dad were sitting in their car while my mum saw a car pull up next to them. As the man got out and just stood there by his car, she quickly noticed that it was the same man from before. My mum immediately told this to my dad, and again my dad denied it, but my mum looked into his car and saw the very recognisable colourful blanket that my dad used as a seat cover. This was when my dad finally connected the dots and got out of the car to confront the man, but the man realising what was happening jumped back into the car and drove away. 
they didn't have time to get the license plate. The next week when my dad was filling up gas into his car, a car pulled up right behind him and lo and behold it was the same man. My dad immediately got into the guy's face ready to confront him but the man's friends got out the car and one of them pulled out a gun. The man with the gun then told everyone to get inside the car and the group drove away. It's been almost 30 years and they've never seen those men since. To this day, my parents still wonder if all of these encounters were a mere coincidence or something far more sinister. This happened to me while I was serving as a missionary and is one of the scariest experiences of my life. This is also the reason why I will forever be grateful of what we refer to as the gut feeling. For some context, I was in the rural county of northern Georgia. Five of my friends and I had received a call from our church leader to go to the house of a close friend and help them with their yard. Being volunteer missionary young men, we jumped at the opportunity. We travelled to the corner of northeast Georgia to a place that wasn't even a town, but more a neighbourhood with huge houses and spacious woods on all sides. I actually can't find the place on Google Maps, as there were no distinguishing features or landmarks to base my location off. After an hour of driving, we arrive at a house, and we're met by a woman called Linda. She told us to drive up a hill to help her on her sister's property. When she told us this, we drove up a paved road that looked like an escape maze from a kid's menu restaurant. We arrive at the top of a paved road on the hill. When we get to the top, we see three abandoned trailers. For some layout context, we park our car and every significant landmark is from the view of the driver. At the top of the road, it was flat for a hundred yards-ish. In front of the car, the hill continues to ascend. However, it was just dirt past the end of the paved section. In front of us, where the hill continued, was one trailer, about 40 feet or so up the hill. On the left from the car was another trailer, still on the flat ground. On the right from the car was the final trailer, which was up the hill but to the right, neighbouring the first trailer. The entire property is littered with trash and garbage. Imagine the TV show Hoarders, but rather than one house being messy, it was an entire acre of property in shambles. The woman's sister, Sherry, was not there at the time, so Linda showed up to the property with her husband, called Brett. She tells us that we're doing this without her sister's knowing, as her sister is a hoarder and serious drug addict. She told us to throw everything we see into a big metal trash container. When she told us this, we felt a little uneasy, but didn't think too much of it. I wish I had listened to my gut. Linda tells us to clear out everything before her sister gets there, as Linda had actually bought the property back from her sister and was due to have the lease in a few weeks. Linda and her husband leave and we get started. I won't talk too much about the cleaning process, as there's nothing noteworthy to mention. That's it, until I started working on the property that was straight up the hill. Each of the trailers were within a 50 feet or so distance from each other, so we were all within sight and sound. However, I was always the type of person to explore abandoned places given the reasonable opportunity, and decided to be adventurous and go into the back of the first trailer, being out of sight of my friends. I get to the back, and there's so much trash continuing to pile upwards, the incline of the hill, and there's an open door. The back door was completely open, and I started to walk towards it. As I approached it, I noticed that it was littered and piled to the ceiling with trash. Yet, there was a walkway to get around inside the trailer. As I got about five feet away and stopped, and something in my gut screamed at me to run out of there immediately. And so I did. And when I got back in view, Sherry was at the property. I had to have been back there for at least five minutes, and I didn't hear the car arrive. Sherry was inside the metal container throwing stuff we put back outside to the yard. We all felt uneasy as Linda arrives. She got up and started arguing with her sister, so we decided to leave. You might be wondering why I'm sharing this story if there was only a tiny bit of family drama, and I wish I could say that was it. 
that something else happened on the property while we were there. An older gentleman from our congregation had been acquainted with the project while we weren't there and decided to meet up with us on the same day for dinner to help him on his own property. We actually helped him on the same day, quite an eventful day. We met at a huddle house and his brother, Carl, told us that after we left, the two sisters had a serious falling out. He told us that when he showed up three days later to assist with the project, there were cops at the trailer property. Apparently the cops were called by Linda, who had seen someone in one of the trailers. The cops had found squatters in one of the trailers, the trailer straight up the hill. I asked how long they'd been there and apparently they'd been there for weeks. When he said that, my heart stopped and my mind froze for a moment. I then realized that none of my friends at the time knew I was up behind the house and I was probably mere feet away from walking in on multiple squatters. This place was in the middle of nowhere and there were squatters likely watching us from the window the entire time. Since then, I've become acquainted with several styles of martial arts. At the time, however, I had barely started with them and wouldn't have stood a chance against one squatter, let alone multiple at once, in a secluded area in the woods to boot. To this day, I am grateful that I listened to my gut feeling when it mattered most and recommend everyone hearing this to do the same. Most of my family for the longest time was centrally located in Florida, going back generations. That's changed as people have gotten older, passed on, and of course needed to move out due to the job market in the state stagnating. But back when I was sort of the black sheep of the family for being one of the very first to get out, I still tried to make trips down there to see them. Though, when time and money allowed for it since I was in my early 20s, and trying to keep my head above water financially. Anyway, for this particular trip, I decided to introduce my then boyfriend, now husband, to everyone. And on top of that, having company on an extended road trip was a plus. It was also time for us to try and get out our shiny newfangled GPS to get us to where we were going, since it had been a long time since my last journey, and I didn't really trust my memory to lead me through Florida's roads. At least, not until I was in my home city proper. It turned out to be an almost entertainingly terrible trip. We were hit by fog and rain at the state border, to the point where visibility was nearly zero. And for one of the few times that I'd seen in years in that state, we got hit by hail in big enough pieces that it eventually broke one of my car's wipers. After debating whether we wanted to chance stopping by trying to find a place to pick up a replacement and essentially having to navigate this terrible weather with an increasingly shaky GPS device, while it also being the middle of the night, we decided to keep on trucking, and I made do with what visibility I could. Besides, I figured being able to read the road signs wouldn't matter so much since we had our computerized roadmap giving us instructions. Well, that's what I thought, except at some point that calm mechanical voice instructed us to take an unexpected turn off the main road. And after a little back and forth with my significant other, we half jokingly decided to go with the flow and take it, figuring we could easily make a U-turn if it was completely off the mark. For all we knew, it was operating with information about some kind of road obstruction or accident that we couldn't see yet, because the weather was still absolutely awful. So we drive along for a good amount of distance and pretty much within the first few miles, every other bit of traffic has dropped off. Then, for a few minutes and another turn later, the road makes an abrupt transition from concrete to gravel, and I shrug my shoulders and chalk it up to at least a somewhat entertaining dog leg into our trip. Even if I still can't make out any of the landscape in this soupy weather, I tell my significant other to just keep his eyes peeled for a good place to turn around, since our two-lane road has turned into an unpaved, one-lane path with a ditch running up each side surrounding by increasingly heavy trees. One bit of silver lining, though, is that the horrible spew falling from the sky at this point finally pauses, giving us a bit of relief and making me not so afraid to get our car stuck in the mud 
while making my eventual turnaround. That also meant we get an unobstructed view as the woods break on one side of us, revealing what looks like an old farming house sticking out like a sore thumb. And who boy, we both felt absolutely silent when we saw this thing. It looked very abandoned, which in itself is not to be unexpected. Florida backcountry, as I was familiar with, tended to be flat as a pancake, with fields and sporadic wooded sections, and every once in a while you'd get some abandoned building, usually from someone who owned more land than they could maintain, or just couldn't afford any more. This fit the bill with this empty, broken down and peeling whitewashed boards, although it had a surprisingly well-maintained clear space around it, with evenly cut grass in a stretch about as big as a decently sized yard, and festooned around that clear space, sometimes sitting up on a piece of raggedy furniture or set up in little dioramas on the saggy porch of the building, adults. Hundreds of varyingly shaped dolls, some marionette types with worn down joints or stuffed cabbage patch style ones. One human sized mannequin set on a rocking chair so that it stared at you not five feet from the road, which was especially disorienting because the fog hadn't fully cleared. So you just saw this head and shoulders emerging from the mush before you could see it wasn't actually a person and I'm not ashamed to say that I veered over as sharply as I could on that narrow path because it fooled me for a handful of seconds. We're both rubbernecking like crazy as we pass this thing because the more you look, the more you see all the attention to detail someone went into setting everything up. Some of the dolls are sitting at tiny table-sized tables and chairs, having tea with one another with cracked and dirty glasses. Some of them have clothes but no hair, some have hair but are slumped on the ground like they'd been forgotten, while others are very purposefully placed. I can't even imagine how much effort had been sunk into that little abandoned house, but only on its dull residence. We passed that place without a single word and waited until it had finally veered out of our sight, and then I turned us around regardless of how narrow the path still was. We had come to the silent consensus that our little side trip was now done. When we went past the place again, I was going about as quickly as I judged for our janky lemon of a car, and I'm sure my husband got a good eyeful the second time round. Nowadays, we still occasionally reference the dollhouse when talking about trips to Florida, and then one of us will air guitar a riff from the dueling banjos of deliverance, but it's definitely one of those things you can only find entertaining from several states away, and not with a dead-eyed mannequin staring directly at your car as you drive past. A few years ago, I worked as a federal agent on the southern border of Arizona. The majority of my job duties would entail me being in my patrol vehicle assigned to watch specific parts along the border, or what we would call roving patrol, to go around to the open desert and being proactive on finding any footprints to find potential drug smugglers or cartel activity. Sometimes we would hike trails for miles, if we believed that they were used to smuggle in people or drugs and investigate them from there. A lot of the time we would patrol alone, due to the lack of manpower and the vast amount of area we were responsible for. On that particular day, I had an assignment that was at least an hour east from the town that we were stationed in, pretty much at the base of this mountain range. This area of the operation in southern Arizona was really desolate once you drove away from the town, with hardly even any ranch houses being out towards that way. There was only me and about three agents responsible for this wide stretch of border that day. At the time, I worked the swing shift, and it was around 9.30 p.m. My buddy Joe, who had an assignment about 25 minutes away from me in roughly the same area, called me and told me that we should do a nighttime hike to this spot upon the mountains that had a good overview of the lay of the land and that is sometimes used as an observational post for the cartel scouts, or what we would call a nest. We didn't get off until midnight, so I thought it would be a good workout and it would pass the time. 
I drove as close to this spot as I could, on a rocky, dirt road up the mountains. I parked my patrol vehicle on what resembled a small cul-de-sac and waited a few minutes for Joe to show up. Once I saw him, we geared up and put our body armor on, grabbing our night vision, our rifles, and of course our water. Hydrate or die. We made sure we were doing all of this quietly, because sound really does carry in the dead of night out in the open desert. I notified dispatch that me and Joe were going to be away from our patrol vehicles and on foot in this location, and we made our way up the mountain. As soon as our eyes got adjusted to the dark, I had done this hike to this spot only once before, during the daytime, and it was honestly still terrible, as it was a very steep climb up the mountain. We climbed about 500 feet up, when I happened to look down to where we parked our patrol units, and I saw a bright light just right next to where we parked our vehicle. It looked like just one light but I could barely see our two units parked and this light there just in a static position staying perfectly still. I tried quietly to get Joe to stop climbing up and to see what I was seeing. I don't remember exactly what was said, but it went something like this. Hey man, do you see that down there? Yeah, dude, is that another vehicle? I don't know. I'm pretty sure we would have heard a vehicle driving out here, but that's right next to our trucks. Yeah, mate, that's what it looks like. All the roads out here are on rocky, crappy dirt roads, and like I said before, sound really travels at night, out in the desert. We had thought it may have been another agent who parked behind our trucks, but if it was, they would have notified us on radio to give us a heads up that they were in the area. We went on the radio to ask if any other agents were near our landmark, and nobody else answered, which told us no. We agreed to climb back down the mountain to where the light was and investigate. I tried using my night vision to get a better look at the light, but I still couldn't make anything out. On part of the hike down, we lost sight of our vehicles and the light. Once we were able to see our vehicles again, the light was gone. What the hell, it was right here! Joe whispered to me. I don't know, I don't see it anywhere. We both became quiet in the hopes of hearing anything, but it was dead quiet. No light other than from the moon. We heard no engines, no sounds of vehicles driving down a mountain, and we got down to where we parked and spent some time investigating the surrounding area, looking for footprints, tire tracks in the brush, any sign that something else was there next to our units. We didn't find anything except our own footprints and tire tracks, and we ended our little hike after this, notified dispatch we were back to our vehicles, and made our way back to the station. We've both been in dangerous scenarios, but this was definitely the oddest thing we ever experienced. From where we were, we would have definitely heard and seen headlights from a vehicle, and it would be suicidal for someone to drive up the mountain without headlights due to the dangerous terrain. Not to mention this area is miles away from any buildings, out on some dirt roads that hardly ever get used by anyone other than us. It could have possibly been someone with a flashlight or some sort of light source, but I've apprehended groups of smugglers with flashlights in the past and this definitely was not one of them, or normal kind of behaviour. Normally if they suspect agents are around, they'll turn off their flashlights and hide to avoid apprehension. This light was perfectly still, and I don't suspect that if it was a person, they would have known exactly where Joe and I were at. I never saw the light source move from that one spot until we lost it. I've never had another experience like this out in the field, and I hope to never have one like this again. Around seven months ago, I was on a little walk in the woods when I found a machete that was buried in the dirt. Not very deep at all, like someone had just thrown dirt on it in a hurry and left. I took it home to hang on my wall. Well, yesterday, the coroner and police department came to my mum's house after I found her boyfriend dead on the floor. They searched the house for drugs and took my machete. They came back asking whose it was, and I told them it was mine and that I had found it in the woods fair and square. The machete, as it turns out, had dried blood on it that belonged to a girl 
that went missing not long ago. So my machete was linked to a missing persons report. Me, my ex-boyfriend and another friend had been visiting friends up north. We live in Germany. Me and one of the friends we were visiting are Wiccan. Our holiday was coming up, so we asked our friends to join us for a ritual. For this, we needed corn leaves. So we are on our quest to find corn leaves. It's pitch black and around 11 p.m. We're already out of the city and in the middle of nowhere, on a path between fields. We're four people holding the flashlight. Everyone's got a beer and music and the mood is pretty good. Then my friend who's walking slightly in front of me says, something's walking out there, and stops walking. I get this instant chill as I hear something rustling in the high grass beside the path and just scream, like being stabbed to death scream. I don't know why I did, I just was scared from zero to a hundred in a millisecond. And she goes, oh, I think it's just a deer. We calm down because I'm thinking, oh, I was just scared by a deer when the rustle starts again, but I don't see anything. I should be able to see a deer because I'm holding a flashlight, or at least something. But the grass and the rustling continues, as does my fear, and I scream again. And my friend said she saw something standing at the side of the road and crawl across it. None of the others are saying anything. I'm crying, and we hear the rustling again, and a giggling. An almost evil-sounded giggling. I don't want to sound dramatic here, but after, we all confirmed that's exactly what we heard. I began crying, feeling like a panic attack was going to come on, and we've never booked it that fast back to town in our lives. I don't know what it was, but I do know that I will not be returning. In the woods near my home, some friends and I love to explore and find undiscovered places. We hear loud bangs at night very often. We're not sure if they're gunshots or fireworks, so one day we decide to go through some thick brush that we've never been through before. We found three chairs facing each other, one that had two bullet holes through the back, and one knocked down. There was also a bag of what we think were drugs in the middle of there, and we left soon after. That happened four years ago, and nowadays the place is known as a drug dealer spot in our friend group, and we have to educate the newcomers to not approach the area. At night, me and my husband were in the car in a road that crossed the woods. My husband was driving, and I was sitting next to him. We were alone in the dark. The only light was from our car when suddenly we saw a very bright and white light that came in the direction of my window, and we both looked to the side and saw a weird and tall humanoid silhouette that seemed to be holding this light in front of its face. It happened so fast, but we both remembered this scene as in slow motion. As soon as we passed this thing, the light was out. There were no vehicles beyond ours, and it couldn't be the light from our car reflecting on something. I don't think it could be a person either. It was far too weird, and why would a person wander in the middle of the woods at night without any light and only turn it on right when our car passed by, and then turn it off again? We live in rural East Texas, in what is considered to be the Bigfoot capital of Texas. My family has lived on our property for over a hundred years now. In the late fall of 2020, we began having what most of the world would consider odd activity on our property. Now to preface, our property is mostly woods and swamp and butts up against more properties that are even less visited that are also forest and swamp. Some of the neighboring properties only have people visit for a few days each year in deer season and are otherwise vacant of humans for the rest of the year. And some of the waterways get into pretty dark and isolated stretches of river bottoms. In the evenings around sunset and into the earlier hours of the night, we began to hear, on occasion, 
odd bird-like whistling noises coming from the woods across the road in the forest and swamp areas. Our homes are on the other side of the road from the undeveloped property, and these weird noises would come from the wood line near and after nightfall sometimes. It sounds like birds whistling and chirping, except it didn't sound exactly like birds. It sounded like something doing a really good job of mimicking birds whistling and chirping. This went on for months, but sadly I never got any audio recording of anything. My father, an experienced hunter and woodsman, said he kept trying to locate the source of the noises, but when he would get close to it, the sounds would always move away. He said it would continue to do so, almost as if whatever was making the noise was trying to lure him into the woods. Having seen too many movies, he opted out of that situation and went into the house. This all climaxed in January of 2021, when I was out to our vehicle to get something from out the back, when suddenly, not too far into the wood line, I heard the most chilling noise I've ever heard in my life. As I was retrieving my bag, a loud animal-type roar erupted from the wood line near the gate that accessed our property, which is located just opposite the road as my driveway. I have spent my entire life studying and working with animals, namely exotics, and the best I can compare the sound to was a large male silverback gorilla roaring. I want you to understand that this sound was primal and alarming, that actually I mildly pissed myself reflexively. I searched for days on YouTube, and the closest sound I found was a video of a male gorilla at a zoo suddenly roaring to intimidate some onlookers. And it gets weirder from here. Not being one to simply assume my family is being hunted by some kind of monster, I decided to grab my headlamp, sidearm, and AK-47 rifle and head down into the woods to see what was making these sounds. I wish I could say that I saw a huge Sasquatch and had some epic shootout, but I didn't. I sat in my vehicle in the woods in total darkness for some time. I even played the Sierra sounds over my vehicle speakers to see if anything would show up, but sadly, and perhaps thankfully, nothing did. However, before leaving the woods, I headed back up to our cabin to make sure everything was normal around the cabin. We actually have had people break in before, so I wanted to make sure everything was as it should be. I searched the immediate area with my headlamp and rifle, and while there was some large animals that stayed just out of my line of sight due to thick undergrowth, I'm mostly certain it was a feral pig, which can get very large and dangerous. The oddest part of all of that is when I checked the slough, a semi-permanent body of standing water near our cabin, and there was an animal in a tree that I couldn't identify. A small animal about two feet tall sitting on its haunches and about a foot wide. It had no obvious or visible tail and appeared to clearly have four appendages. It was clearly some sort of mammal, but since the water was higher than normal due to wet winter, I couldn't get a better angle to get that close to it without wading into the icy water. This animal had silver-colored fur with texture rather similar looking to that of a chinchilla, and for all my attempts, it would never show its face or paws, as it kept those distinguishing features tucked into its body like it was sleeping, despite it clearly reacting to the sounds I made on the ground. I have tried for everything I can think of to identify this creature. It wasn't a possum, nor a raccoon. It wasn't an owl or young owl with downy feathers, and I cannot place this animal with any local species of fauna, even if it had some health issues like mange. The closest thing I have been able to find is a silvery gibbon, which are obviously not native to eastern Texas. My wife still half jokes that I found a baby Sasquatch tucked away in a tree by its parent, and I honestly don't know what to think about all this. But after that night, I haven't had any more strange activity than I'm aware of. I am a very open-minded yet rational person, and I have grown up in these woods. I've studied and kept numerous animal species, and have helped with government ecological projects in our area. I've taught biology and ecology classes, but this will baffle me for the rest of my life. What did I find? Could it have been 
a baby Sasquatch. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. Right then, um, as some of you may have seen or heard from the video I put out the other day, um, all of my data from the last year and a half was accidentally deleted by myself. So I'm going to give you a bit more context. My youngest, Aurora, woke up at like 3.40 or something. It took me two hours to get her back to sleep. And I thought, wow, I'm awake, I might as well start recording. So I go and try and record a video when I see that I've run out of memory, so I can't record anything. So Premiere Pro has these files that it creates that you can just delete. They're not really necessary. It's just to speed up the work process. So I just highlight it and delete it, the folder, and then empty the recycling bin. Me not having slept all that much and being quite tired, I start recording and then all of a sudden, the recording I'd done the day before, as part of the same video, doesn't work. So I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? And I hear back and it's just the wrong audio. It doesn't actually make sense. So I go back and try another project, a video that I did the day before, and it doesn't work. It says all the files are gone. So then I realize, after I look into the Premiere Pro folder, that I had deleted something called the... I can't remember what it's called, but basically where all the audio is stored for every video you make. So that was fun. And, um, yeah, I wasn't very happy about that. I feel like a real, <laughs> like a real fool, to be honest. So then I spent a number of days trying to recover the data. I used one data recovery software, it didn't work. I then had to use another one, and I thought I'd found all the files. And then after buying the full version, I realized that it wasn't actually what I'd lost because all the files are called like audio one, audio two, audio three. And then I emailed the company and they emailed me back and then I emailed them back and they haven't got back to me yet. So I'm using my wife's laptop right now, hopefully so that it doesn't jeopardize the chances of losing, of getting it back, but it's absolutely nowhere to be found on the drive. So I think it's all gone, <laughs> which isn't very good for compilations and such. So I'm going to have a really good time re-recording everything for the app and compilations. So that's going to be fun. So just want to let you know that's why there's been a delay. And I'm really sorry to each and every one of you. I, I know you wait for these videos and I appreciate you guys watching the older ones and stuff. But I had some really fun stuff that I was going to launch. <sighs> I don't even want to tell you because I don't want to spoil it, but it was so good. And I put so much effort into it. I'm really bummed that it's all gone. So there you go. I'm going to work this these next few days to try and get it back. Probably wake up tomorrow early if one of my daughters doesn't wake me up before to, um, to try and make it happen. So there you go. Um, sorry for the long explanation, but I think you guys deserve it. A huge thank to everyone who supports me on Twitter. I mean, Patreon and YouTube memberships. Um, and I hope to see you again in the next few days for another video. And again, I'm really sorry for everything, for the delays and stuff. Much love to you all. Take care, guys. Back up your data. <laughs> Bye.